Hello, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to today's uh, live stream. We are uh, very ex excited to have you all with us this morning to continue on an important conversation that started last week as Treaties Recognition Week. And today we have a, another special day in uh, that today is known as Indigenous Veterans Day. So as you can see behind me is a field of poppies. And it's another opportunity to learn about incredible people who have uh, been left out of the history books and seldom are talked about. So today we're here with Morris, who's gonna introduce himself and share with you some really important information. Um, we will be having a Q&A session. So teachers, that form was emailed out to you, but you can also access it down below in the description box of the YouTube where you can click on the link and um, input your questions for today. Uh, we probably won't get to all your questions. We will do our very best. Um, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Morris. Oh, good, good morning, everybody. I, I hope the sun is shining on you uh, like it is up here in, um, in beautiful North Bay. I'm, I'm about two, 250 or 300 miles. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't use the metric system as much as I should. I guess that's about, uh, what, about four or 500 kilometers north of where most of you are. And um, I'm, I'm speaking to you from the traditional territory of Anishinaabek people and and Anishinaabek, the Anishinaabek nation <clears throat> of indigenous peoples um, uh, occupied most of uh, central and south Ontario and most of you are on Anishinaabek uh, traditional lands today. So, so um, um, I'm I'm really grateful to be invited to uh, to talk to you. I've I've been on. Zoom or, or Google Meets or Google Teams or other uh, online platforms for uh, much of the past uh, week or so, talking to students of all ages and teachers and organizations um, uh, about um, uh, treaties recognition. Um, and today we're gonna talk about treaties, but, um, but first I'm gonna introduce myself <clears throat> and um, I'm going to use a language uh, that's been used in what we call Canada for thousands of years. Um, some people think that Canada is a French-English bilingual country. Well, the greeting I'm going to give you is in a language called Anishinaabemowin. Some people call it Ojibwe uh, that was being spoken here thousands of years before anybody spoke English or French um, on the shores of, of our country here. Anibojo Benezi Dijnakas, excuse me. Wajashk Dodam Anishnabek, Angwaro Dodam Hodnashoni, Alderville Donjiba, North Bay and Dayan, Anishnabek and Dao. So um, I'm gonna have a drink here. <clears throat> I'm prone to allergies in the mornings. So um, I've said, I've greeted you as friends, Niji. And I've said that uh, I've been given a name, Benesi, which is, uh, uh, <clears throat> it's actually short for Nimki Benesi, which is Thunderbird. And some indigenous peoples get names when they're born. Some of us get it later in life. Sometimes it relates to uh, what we do in, in our life. Uh, I said that I come from two indigenous clans um, through my grandfather's um, Mississauga um, heritage. I am Muskrat or Wajash clan. And through my great grandmother, uh, uh, I am Kanyagahaga or, or uh, Mohawk and that's Wolf clan. And my family indigenous roots are in a, a First Nation community called Alderville, the Mississaugas of Alderville First Nation, which is east of most of, most of you. It's, um, it's around Coburg, Ontario, and on the shores of Rice Lake, uh, where they used to gather and still gather some wild rice that grows in the water. Um, and I said that we're part of the Anishinaabek Nation, 
and um, nations are very important. There are probably about 40 or 50 nations uh, of indigenous peoples across Canada that, that share similar languages and, and uh, customs and, and um, uh, uh, laws. And, um, but uh, when often the, the terminology gets very confusing because uh, we know that there are over 600 little communities that call themselves First Nations, but they are really part of these larger collections of, of communities that are called nations. And as I said, the Anishinaabek nation uh, is, is one of the major nations in what we now call Ontario. And um, there, there are also the, the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois, nations and the Meshkegawak or Cree nations and there are many Métis people who who have for a long time called uh, this area their home. So um, so that's that's my greeting to you and and this is a, a really important week to remember things and uh, uh, you know as as Ms. Williams said this is um, it's Remembrance Day week. Um, Thursday, uh, November 11th is, is regarded by, by people around the world as Remembrance Day because that was, it was on November 11th in um, 1918 that the first great world war actually came to an end. And, um, uh, and that was the first time that, that such a horrible um, um, war that involved countries from all around the world took place where millions and millions of people died. It was a horrible thing. And uh, you'd think that human beings would learn from those things, but we've still had many wars since. Um, and uh, Canadians have played a huge role in, in defending, even though the war wasn't, wasn't on our soil, in our country, it was overseas, uh, Canadians have, have fought to defend um, uh, countries like England and, you know, um, who were closer to where the battlefields were um, because so many um, Canadians are descended from people in, in uh, European countries like France and, and Britain. But today has been since uh, 1994 has been commemorated as uh, National Indigenous Veterans Day. And the reason for a separate day is that um, indigenous um, um, soldiers have been defending uh, Canada longer than anybody else because we were here first. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really an important uh, day. There's in Ottawa, the capital of Canada, there's a, a, a for about the last 20 years, there has been a, a, a national a memorial for indigenous warriors and veterans. Um, and there will be people there today commemorating um, uh, their service, uh, again, to defend Canada uh, before there was a Canada, to defend the lands on which Canada sits. And so we also want to remember today something else that's really important. Uh, when I said that, that indigenous people have de been defending Canada before there was a Canada, well, if it weren't for Indigenous peoples, there would not be a country called Canada because our, um, uh, my Indigenous ancestors um, agreed with your non-Indigenous ancestors um, to share the lands. And before that happened for thousands of years, uh, what we call Canada, the only people who lived here were Indigenous peoples. And um, uh, it's only been fairly recently, and by recent I mean 500 years, that uh, people came here from other parts of the world, mainly Europe, mainly countries um, like France and England, or England as part of Britain, um, uh, to start uh, uh, colonies or settlements. And, um, uh, and that's what 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 uh, I want to talk about today. And I'm going to use I'm going to use um, um, I'm going to share the screen here. And and going to talk about um, a book, a little book that I helped 
that um, I helped create uh, a few years ago for a school board up here near North Bay. It's called the Near North District School Board. You can see their logo in the lower right hand corner. And, um, and I wrote the text for this story and the artist uh, who has illustrated it was my good friend, Jack Smallboy, who is, um, uh, he is a, um, a Meshkegawak or, or Cree artist, very talented. He carves in wood and in stone and, and he paints and, and he's a very talented artist. And he now lives in North Bay, but he comes from uh, up north, even further north than I am in North Bay. He's another five or 600 kilometers further north um, in a place called Moose Factory, which is on James Bay. And Jack uh, was in residential school when he was a young boy, like thousands and thousands of Indigenous children across Canada. His parents were forced to send him to a residential school. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of sad uh, in many ways, but, but uh, uh, they never called students like Jack um, uh, by, their, for, by their name. Uh, he was number 14. And that's all how he was known in his um, days at residential school. The teachers would say, number 14, do this, do that. Very, uh, very scary for young children. And you're going to learn more about those things. Uh, some of you as you, um, you know, as you advance in school. Um, so uh, in this book, um, we, we called it Grandpa, What is a Treaty Anyway? because so many people don't know what a treaty is, particularly a treaty with indigenous peoples on which uh, Canada really is based. Um, you students are among the first students in Canadian history to learn some of these things because these were stories that were not told in our schools. And um, so you're, you're very fortunate that you're among the first, um, many of your parents would not have been told these stories and certainly not your grandparents. I wasn't taught these things in school. So it's important for us to learn about our country's past. And that helps us uh, all work to make it the best it can be in the future. Um, so uh, in, on, the, on the cover, the, you can see that what Jack drew, you can see a piece of paper or parchment and that's how the Europeans would have made a treaty or an agreement. And uh, you can see a, a pen they used to use in the old days Pens were made out of um, the, the feathers of birds and they, they pointed the end or the, the, um, the quill of the feather um, into a point so they could write with it and then they dipped it in ink and then they, they wrote with it. That's, that's how they uh, used to write. And then below that you see something very important and it's, it's a pipe and we call it a pawagan. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's, used in a very important ceremonial way by uh, many indigenous peoples. Uh, we believe that the plant tobacco, and not that, that tobacco they sell in stores that can kill you if you smoke too many cigarettes, uh, but tobacco that's grown naturally as a plant. Uh, many indigenous peoples were taught that's the first plant that God the creator gave us. And it's a very special plant and we give it to people um, as a gesture of respect and gratitude. We give them a little bundle of tobacco. Um, we, we put it on the ground to say thank you in certain occasions. Um, maybe, if, maybe if we've picked a lot of, of strawberries or raspberries and we're very grateful to, uh, to Mother Earth for giving us those, we might put some tobacco down and say thank you, miigwech. Um, but when tobacco is put in that pipe and smoked, we, our belief is that our prayers and our promises go up in the smoke towards the creator. So you remember this, this pipe because we, we're gonna be talking about it. it was very important in the promises that were made when treaties were, um, were first um, put into force in, in this country. So that's how, that's how this story started. And, and it says on the second page of our little book, Understanding treaties is a part of our collective journey in learning about the country we live in and our nation's history. 
Treaties are a part of our collective identity. We hope that this story helps our students to better understand the nature of treaty relationships. We are all treaty people. Now, when we talk about our country's history, uh, most of you I'm sure know that when you celebrate every July 1st, what's called Canada Day, that Canada came into being as a country on July 1st, 1867. So that's, um, that means that Canada as a country is only about 154 years old. But Indigenous peoples were here thousands of years ago. And the treaties that we're going to be talking about, those agreements um, that happened hundreds of years before Canada's confederation, that's what they call when Canada started, th th that confederation would never have happened if it wasn't for the treaties that were made. So you have to imagine, and I know you, you know, kids have really good imaginations. You have to imagine these two characters, just like many animated uh, films and cartoons you watch, they, they give human characteristics to different animals like um, SpongeBob SquarePants, for example, or, or many other, other characters. Um, and you have to imagine the two main characters in our story are eagles. And eagles are very important birds for many indigenous peoples because they fly high and uh, that makes them very special. Um, and so this is a little girl called Phoenix Eagle and her grandpa's name is Magizi Eagle. And Magizi in that language that I, I spoke earlier, uh, Anishinaabemowin, um, Magizi means eagle. So grandpa's name is Eagle Eagle. And he's very old, very old. And um, you have to imagine that he's hundreds of years old, very wise. And um, uh, there are many different kinds of eagle, but uh, uh, Grandpa uh, Eagle, Magizi Eagle is a bald eagle. And they call uh, uh, that, that species of eagle bald because when they're about seven years old, all the feathers on their head turn white. Um, they're not really bald, but you can see Jack actually put a little bald spot on top of Magizi Eagle's head there. So, so you'll know he's a really a bald eagle. So this is his kitchen and uh, where he lives. And uh, every day after school, uh, his, his granddaughter, uh, Phoenix, drops in for, for a little snack on her way home. Uh, I know that, that sometimes we're a bit hungry after working so hard in school and, and can't wait for supper. We have to have something to tide us over. So Grandpa's uh, Magizi Eagle is used to having her milk and cookie snack ready. You can see the cookies on the counter and he's pouring her milk and she's coming in she's got her backpack on and she's dropping in for her after school milk and cookie snack and then she asks grandpa what is a treaty anyway so this often happens when when I'm sure when you learn new things in school and you're not really sure and maybe you come home and ask your your mommy and daddy um what's this or what's that so she stops first with her wise old, old grandpa and she asks him, what is a treaty anyway? Well, well, my child, begins Magizi Eagle. Treaty is a fancy word for promise, promise. And, um, and he's telling her this story. And when, when he tells stories that happened a long time ago, you can see that they're in black and white. And he's saying, the humans who came to these shores, now he's talking about people as humans because of course he and Phoenix are eagles. The humans who came to these shores from far away used it when they first came here. So he's showing and telling her a, a picture in his mind of the first Europeans that came here about 500 years ago in their boats and a very dangerous journey they made across the Atlantic Ocean. Most of the first people that came were from France the ones that came after mainly were from England or Britain, as it's called. And you can see all of the, on the shore waiting for them were the indigenous people. Some people call them native people. They used to call them Indians, but, um, but uh, indigenous peoples. 
and, and, you know, and as long as the newcomers that came here came peacefully, they were welcomed. And the people who welcomed them showed them things that they couldn't have known from coming from halfway around the world. They, they showed them what was good to eat and how to hunt and how to make a bow and arrow and, and um, uh, where the plants were that, that, that contained medicine if they got sick. And uh, what to do when there was so much snow on the ground that they had never seen before. Show them how to make snowshoes. They could walk on top of the snow. Show them how to make canoes so they could travel on the on the lakes and the rivers. Things they never saw before uh, where they came from. Um, and show them how to build homes and lodges. And they really saved them um, from, in many cases, almost certain starvation or death because this was very different, the country here in what we call Canada from the countries that they came from in other parts of the world. And you know, we, today we talk about people coming to Canada uh, from other parts of the world like Afghanistan or uh, Syria or Iraq. We, we call them refugees because they're coming here from conditions that aren't very good. Well, most of these people that came to uh, North America, or what we call Canada now, they were refugees because they didn't have very good lives back home. They they lived almost like slaves. They couldn't own their own land. Uh, they didn't have freedom of speech. Um, and so it was very brave of them to take these very dangerous trips across the Atlantic. Many people died on those uh, long voyages but that's how desperate they were to get away from very bad conditions to, uh, to join these voyages of exploration, as they call them. So grandpa says a treaty is a fancy word for promise. It's a word that, um, that was used when these peoples first started to come here. So by now, um, McGeezy and his granddaughter are, are sitting comfortably in his living room and uh, Phoenix is munching away on one of her cookies and she looks up at her wise old grandfather and he had said a treaty is a fancy word for promise. Well, now she says, but what were the promises about? So, and he, he is sipping his, it could be tea or coffee or hot chocolate. You can see the steam rising out of his cup there. So, so now he's remembering when he was very young, and, and he remembered when he was a young bird, you can see him up in the corner, soaring, flying high above a big meeting. And this was called a treaty gathering. And there were two groups of people there. And there were, there were the settler people uh, who, had, uh, who had come from Europe. And they were starting to move across Canada to find land on which to have uh, homes. And um, as they traveled, sometimes they lived in forts. Um, and you can see that fort on the left and it's got an English flag flying above it. And you can see a man with a, a top hat who is the representative of the, the uh, colonists, the settlers. Um, and they're making treaty promises to the indigenous peoples to share their land. So there will be uh, places where the newcomers can call homes. And you can see him shaking hands with the, uh, the chief. And you can tell he's a chief because uh, this must be out west because out in Western Canada, the prairies, uh, the, the chiefs always wore what, they, what are called headdresses or bonnets made out of eagle feathers. Again, the eagle, very special. And, um, and you can see them shaking hands and that handshake is a is an internet it still is an international symbol of friendship and peace and sharing and uh you can see a mounted policeman in the red tunic um uh to pr to protect the, the settlers and um because they were very nervous about the indigenous peoples because they had never seen people like that before so they were very nervous and and that's why they wanted to have peace and friendship with them. And on the table, you can see uh, what we call treaty commissioners, government, uh, settler government people who are, and you can see them one writing with one of those quill pens with the feather. 
and he's writing the agreement, the promises down. And um, uh, the promises would include things like, oh, the, some of the promises they made were, uh, we will always give your people, if you share your land with us, we will always give you a medicine chest. Well, that meant health care. And we will always make a schoolhouse for your children. Well, that meant education. So those are the kind of promises that they made to, in order to um, convince the indigenous peoples to share their land with them. Because remember, nobody else had been here for thousands of years but indigenous people. So Grandpa Eagle is, is smiling and he, he recalls that the, there was dancing and drums and flags and smoke billowed up into the air from many fires and pipes below. So you can see the fires in the background and that's a way to celebrate a big occasion. Uh, you can see there's drumming going on and dancing. That's not entertainment. Those are sacred ceremonies that indigenous peoples have. That's a way of celebrating their culture. And, um, and you can see the chief holding in his arm. Remember what we talked about on the, the cover, that pipe. And when they shake hands and agree to the terms of the treaty, the promises that are being made, um, uh, they, will, they will sit down and they will uh, put tobacco in that pipe and light it and they will pass it around so that the leaders of the, the, the government and the settler communities and the leaders of the indigenous peoples of the area, they will take turns puffing, puffing on that pipe. They don't have to inhale it, just puff on it. And, and their promises and prayers go up to the creator. So this is like, if, I don't know whether you know anything about what happens if someone goes to court, maybe you've seen it on TV. And if they're a witness in court, um, they will be asked to put their hand on a Bible and swear to tell the truth, whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help them God. That's what smoking that pipe meant. It was like a, a very sacred ceremony. So this is why the newcomers, the settlers, the colonists wanted to share the land. They wanted to start building homes like this. They wanted to start cultivating uh, crops. You can see in the background with the plow and many indigenous peoples had, had been farmers, you know, the, the, um, the, the um, Iroquois people, the Haudenosaunee people from down your way in, in Southern Ontario, they were the first people in the world among the first people in the world to grow corn. Um, indigenous peoples have, have been the first peoples in the world to grow potatoes, tomatoes, um, corn, uh, uh, certain kinds of rice. Uh, those are foods that, that many people in the world depend on. And they were given to the world. They were shared with people of the world, first with the Europeans. Um, uh, because that was the way Indigenous peoples felt. If people were your friends, you shared things with them. So you can see the difference in homes. On the left, you see the Indigenous teepees, they call them. Or some people call them wigwams. They could be made out of animal hides and, and held up by poles. And uh, the smoke from fires inside would go up through the opening on the top. And they were very handy because indigenous peoples, many of them, particularly at certain times of the year and particularly in Western Canada, they, they didn't live in one place all the time. They would follow the, um, the game that they depended on for food. And out West, they depended on the bison or the buffalo. And they could pack up their, their teepees pretty quickly and, and, um, and follow the herds. They were... They were uh, they, they often didn't stay in one place all year round. So, <clears throat> so Magizi Eagle remembers out loud now that the newcomers wanted to share the land with the people who had always lived here. And they promised to share it and take care of it forever, as long as the grass grows and the sun shines. So those promises that were made, those treaties were to last forever. And even though those treaties, most of them in Canada, and there are probably about a hundred of them across Canada, um, even though many of them were, were agreed to uh, as long as 200 years ago and more, 250 and more, 
they're still actively promises. They, there's no expiry date on, on, on treaties. They're, they're legal documents and they're uh, sacred promises as we saw from the ceremonies that took place. And they are to last as long as the sun shines. So Phoenix is thinking about all this that her, her wise old grandpa has told her. And she, then she wants to know, but how do promises work? Um, you know, she's still not sure. She knows that uh, a treaty is a promise, but she's not sure exactly how promises work from what her, her grandpa told her. And she's washing down her last bite of cookie with a gulp of ice cold milk. So her grandpa's trying to think of a way that she can understand about, about what promises mean. So he says, you know, you and your mom and dad make promises to each other all the time. You do chores, and I know most of you boys and girls that are listening, I'm sure you do chores at home. I, I've talked to school children that say, you know, that they, they clean their room or they, they put their laundry, their dirty clothing that needs to be washed out for their mom or they help break leaves. Um, and um, so uh, grandpa says, you do chores. I see you help your mom dry the dishes. You can see them doing that. And I see you help your dad take out the, the garbage. They do some, but they do some nice things for you too, don't they? So Phoenix is remembering now. She says, yes, you know, mom makes pizza sometimes for supper. That's a nice treat. And, uh, and dad takes us to the movies. And I get to have my very own bedroom. You can see her lounging on her bed in her very own bedroom. And, you know, not all kids are that lucky to have their very own bedroom, because if you come from a big family, you know, you have to share, might have to share in a bunk bed or, you know, with with brothers or sisters, if you come from a bigger family. So Phoenix now is starting to understand how lucky she is that um, that she gets things from her from her mommy and daddy. So grandpa says, there you go. You you have a treaty started with your mom and dad. So if you think about a treaty as promises and promises and things that, that Phoenix does for her mom and dad and the things they do for her, it's sort of like, kind of like a treaty. Um, and the other thing that, that everybody has to remember is it's if people break their promises, that's not very good. That's um, if, if people and friends and families break promises, that's serious. But if countries break promises, that's, that's very bad. Yeah, because then nobody will want to deal with people who, who um, don't keep their promise. So Phoenix now understands that the treaty is a promise and she knows that promises are things that people do for one another and they, the promises um, can last forever. <clears throat> and um, that people shouldn't break their promises. So. She's wiping the, the last crumbs from her fingers and she's heading out the door and she says, cool, I like promises, especially when they involve pizza. So that's our story. And that's, uh, that's a, a, a little sketch that J my friend Jack did of, of me and of him. And that handshake, remember that handshake between Indigenous peoples and the settlers that denote uh, friendship and peace and sharing. And, and Jack also drew uh, at the end uh, a wampum belt. And, and in, in the Indigenous peoples didn't use paper to put their promises on. Sometimes in certain parts of Canada, they made, uh, they called them belts. They were made out of beads and um, uh, woven uh, from a from seashells that were woven into uh, pictures onto the onto the background, and like here you can see it might be a, a, a woven of a picture of people shaking hands in friendship. Um, but however they um, however they made their agreements, they didn't need to write things down in paper to, for them to be real treaty promises. Um, and many of those promises are, um, are still being discussed today. In fact, almost all of them, because unfortunately, many of those promises weren't kept by Canada. So 
Um, so indigenous peoples have, for example, some of the big promises about education, as I said, the medicine chest was healthcare, education was, was a schoolhouse. Um, many of those promises were not kept and, um, and Canada is starting to try to um, uh, remedy that, um, make sure that their promises are, are kept better than they have in the past. But it's a slow process and, uh, and you young people, one of your jobs when you grow up to be the, um, the doctors and lawyers and members of parliament and journalists and judges, one of your jobs as citizens of this wonderful country called Canada is to try to make sure that those treaty promises are kept um, because you all benefit. Um, those of you who are not indigenous, you have enjoyed the benefits of sharing the land. And if that promise hadn't been made uh, hundreds of years ago, there might not even be a Canada today because Canada is on land that was indigenous occupied land. And many, almost all Canadians enjoy uh, nice schools and hospitals and clean drinking water and all those sorts of things um, that many indigenous peoples have not enjoyed um, because promises were not kept. So, so uh, I, I thank you for, for listening to today and I hope you remember um, this week um, the, the, the sacrifices and contributions of indigenous and non-indigenous soldiers and veterans who have protected uh, Canada. Um, indigenous soldiers protected Canada in the War of 1812. That's a long time ago. And they were really Canada's army. It's the only war ever fought in Canada. Like I said before, most wars are fought overseas. So, so I hope this week you, re you remember uh, the, the, the contributions that, that people, indigenous peoples have, have made. And the biggest contribution, of course, is in agreeing to share the land that you now call your home country. That's a huge contribution. And uh, uh, so thank you for listening. And, and uh, we're going to give you a chance to, you know, to ask questions. And, and, um, uh, and I hope you all uh, in, are enjoying good health during these challenging times and, um, and maintaining all your friendships with, your, with all of your friends and relatives. Okay, miigwech, thank you. Oh, Miigwech, Morris, what a beautiful story that you've shared with us today. Um, there are lots of questions pouring in. So this is, which is really great. We're appreciative of all of your questions and um, we're just trying to organize them into categories here. Um, maybe we'll start, start with some of the questions um, connected with Veterans Day, if that's okay with you, Morris. Sure. Um, so one of the questions that's come in from Upper Grand, a student in Upper Grand District School Board, um, it's in regards to racism in the military. The question is, did you experience, but maybe we can extend it into um, just talking about racism that's in the military. Uh, the question is, did you experience overt racism in the military or was it more a series of microaggressions? So if we kind of move that question into you know, people's experiences in, in the military. Yeah, and thank you for that, for that question. And I, I've never been in the military. I, um, I had, um, from my little community of Alderville, um, uh, which is, as I said, it's east of where you are. Um, many people have, have uh, served in the military in, the, in World War II. I had, I had three uncles in, um, in World War I, my grandfather and, and um, great uncle. Uh, both of whom had been chiefs in their community in Alderville, um, they have their name inscribed on a big monument, a huge war memorial in Alderville that's been there for about 100 years. Um, many Indigenous peoples still do encounter racism, whether it's, uh, with some people think it's teasing just to call Native people chief or some name like that, or 
you know, uh, but that teasing is is uh, when it when it's about someone's background uh, is is not a, a good idea. Uh, whatever your background, whether you're you know whether you're from different different parts of the world, whatever your skin color, it's not a good idea. And as a matter of fact, at one time, they the government was so afraid of the racism that they they only wanted to put. Um, um, native soldiers in groups by themselves. They didn't, they were afraid. They were also afraid that if native soldiers were captured by the enemy in war, that they would be treated very badly because they're, they're different. They look different. Their skin was, was a different color. And that's, unfortunately, racism is part of our society. We're hoping to make it better. Um, but there are still people in our society today who uh, make fun of people who are different from them. And, and you know, as Canada changes, we have so many people now in Canada from different parts of the world um, uh, that the, at one time, a uh, hundred years ago, most people uh, who lived in Canada were from Europe, were mainly light skinned people. And now Canada's population has changed so much that, uh, uh, it's just not, it's really, really not very wise to make fun of people who might be different from you because maybe most people are different from you if you're European. So yes, unfortunately, racism still exists in some parts of the world, it's worse than others. Um, but we like to point out when people make fun or or say bad things about about people of a different background that if you look in Canada alone, look at all the people um, of different backgrounds and what they've achieved, uh, whether it's it's uh, inventing vaccinations or whether they're great hockey players. Like I, you might not know that Carey Price, if you're a hockey fan, the goalie for the Montreal Canadiens that helped defeat the Toronto Maple Leafs last year um, in the playoffs, Carey Price's mother is, is an indigenous chief in her community in British Columbia. Um, we have great artists, we have great doctors, um, uh, you know, in every field. So um, I think we, we should realize that, that racism against people who are contributing so much to our country is just probably not a very smart thing to do. So, but thank you for that question. Um, connected into that question is, what happened to those who did serve um, previously that when they returned back home, um, some real awful things happened to those who did go and serve in um, the wars. Do you wanna talk a little bit about that in terms of how they were treated when they returned back home? Yes, and, and um, it's important to remember that, that uh, in, in indigenous uh, people um, were not required to serve in Canada's armed forces. They were exempt from service. Um, First Nations people were exempt from service. And yet they volunteered. And many of them volunteered because um, they had agreed by these treaty promises to defend Canada, to be allies with, with countries like England. Um, and uh, so they volunteered. In my little community of Alderville, at the time of the First World War, there were only 63 adult men. 38 of them volunteered to serve, even though they didn't have to, and nine of them died. Nine out of 30, um, uh, 38 men that volunteered. Now, when many men came back, they felt that when they went over to, to defend Canada, when they came back, they would not experience the same sort of bad treatment that they had received before they went. But unfortunately, things kind of went back the same. They were not, uh, even though they had defended Canada, they were still governed by the Indian Act. They still had to get a pass from a government employee to leave the, re the reserve. They were not allowed to go into pool rooms to play pool, all kinds of silly rules. So even though they had they had done so much to defend the country on which in which they had been the first people to live, um, they their treatment after they had had made those sacrifices went back to being the way it was, and and that's a great again. Some of these are not happy stories, but students have to learn about them because we want Canada to be better in the days ahead than it was. 
Well, you actually just answered the question that came in from a student in Halton District School Board, which was, did, indig did indig Indigenous people willingly go fight for Canada or were they forced to? So you kind of answered that question that had come up. So thank you for that question. Um, another question here is actually in regards to your book. And the question is from, oh, hang on, where did it go? This is from a student, a grade five student in Dufferin Peel Catholic District School Board. How do people write with feathers? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you can write with anything. You can, you, can, you can get a stick, and if you make a point on it, just a stick that you find on the ground, if you make a point on it and dip it into, you wouldn't even need to have ink. You could, you could maybe get some, some um, strawberries or raspberries or blueberries and squeeze the juice out of them, and you could write with those if you had to. I've heard stories about prisoners in jail who um, I was listening to a story the other day, a man who, who wrote all sorts of things. Uh, he, had a, he got a hold of a lemon through the food that he ate and he wrote in lemon juice, which was invisible. You could only see it um, if, you, if you held a, a candle underneath it and that kind of burned it. So there are people, you know, we take so many things for granted like ballpoint pens and computers. But years ago, people had to be very creative in how they, they wrote, how they, they used to, they didn't have oil paints in tubes if they wanted to do paintings. They had to, to get uh, colors, sometimes grind petals and flowers into powder and, and, and mix that with liquid to make their colors. So um, yeah, writing with, with anything is fairly easy. Um, it's not as, it may, may not be as, as um, it's uh, probably a lot messier than, than writing with a pen that you can keep in your pocket. But, Another question about your book comes from a grade four student in Upper Grand District School Board. When did you make the book, Grandpa, What is a Treaty Anyway? And what gave you the idea to write it? Well, uh, we made it about, I think it's going back about five years right now. And uh, the reason we wanted to do it was um, most of the information about treaties and treaty promises uh, tended to be for older students, some cases university students, and we didn't, the school board said they, they would like something for younger students, elementary students, to help them understand, you know, because most discussions about treaties among adults talk about legal and court cases and things, it's very complicated. So, uh, you know, the idea of a treaty just being a promise seemed to make sense, so we worked with the school board, you know, on the, uh, you know, on the story, and Every, almost every, I think every elementary school student in the school board up here, uh, uh, near North District School Board, which is North Bay to Perry Sound area, got a copy. And many teachers have asked, how can we get a copy of that? And uh, the school boards, they have restrictions about how they can share things. They're not allowed to sell things or so. But I know that if any teachers contact the near North District School Board, and they could ask to speak to a woman named Tracy Hendrick, who right now is their um, uh, leader for First Nations, Métis and Inuit education. Um, I, I know that she would give permission for any, any school board um, to make their own little booklets out of the slides that, that you've seen. And, uh, and as long as they give credit to where the book, uh, who and where the book um, came from, that you could use it for, for yourselves. Uh, we, that's the, we believe in sharing things. Remember, that's what indigenous peoples believe in, sharing things, not, not keeping them to ourselves. Uh, this next question comes from a grade seven student in Halton District School Board. Were you there or your ancestors were were there when they first gave the treaty. So I'm thinking about maybe you want to talk about your grandfather, your great grandfather, or your grandfather. My grandfather, yeah. Grandfather, yeah. Um, well, when anybody asks anything, I've had students say uh, when I show them wampum belts that are 250 years old, they want to know if I was there when when they were presented, and I say I'm not that old, but I'll tell you how old I am. Uh, you you hockey fans will appreciate this. I'm so old. I remember when the Toronto Maple Leafs won the Stanley Cup. That's how old I am. Pretty old. Um, 
I, I, I'm a big Leafs fan, but I can't help uh, poking fun at them, you know. Anyways, um, my grandfather's name was Moses Muskrat Marsden, and he was the chief at Alderville First Nation from about 1905 to 1909. And he, uh, he used to write things down uh, that I have, that I read with great interest. And, and uh, I've read about how hard he and, and members of his council at Alderville tried to get the government of Ontario and Canada to, to create some kind of a treaty because they had been promised um, years before in other earlier treaties that they would always have the right to hunt and fish. And these are the promises that were made to them. And gradually, uh, people from their community, even though they they had been made these promises, uh, uh, when when newcomers came, they just um, they just took on the land. And we, the term we use is squat. If you just move on to someone else's home, like if you came home from school tonight and someone was in your house, that would be squatting. And um, that happened an awful lot because one of the gov- one of the promises that had been made. To indigenous peoples was that the governments would not allow settlers to interfere with their way of life or to or to um, um, trespass. And unfortunately, that happened a lot. And my grandfather and other leaders tried to get the government to do something about it. But the government, it was like the uh, government officials, it was like they never knew that a treaty had ever existed. And but it took until 1923 after my grandfather had left the First Nation that he actually came back and was in the room when the Williams Treaty was agreed to in, um, in November 1923 in Alderville and six other communities. And unfortunately, a lot of treaties, including the Williams Treaty, uh, the promises that were made were um, many of the Indigenous leaders could not read or write English. And they were told things through a translator that turned out not to be true. And the treaty was a very bad thing until it was finally resolved almost a hundred years later that the, the, the seven communities had to go to court to get the government to, you know, to, um, to make the treaty promises uh, honest and respectful. And that's a shame, but but almost every treaty ends up in court because the promises are not kept. And those are things you have to learn about as students. And you have to ask yourself, why? Why would people not keep their promises? And um, the answers are often not very pleasant, but we have to know about it because we want Canada to be better in the future than it was in the past. So, okay. Well, I feel like you've just answered several questions there in your answer. Um, one of the questions was uh, from a grade four student in Dufferin Peel Catholic. What treaty land are you from? So just, I guess, to reiterate, you, where are you from? Yeah, my um, uh, my uh, treaty is Williams Treaty, which is uh, in, the, uh, uh, Williams Treaty is a big area, but, but it's, it's around Peterborough area that, I, that I'm, I'm from. Um, that's where Alderville is in that general area around um, Peterborough, Coburg, that, that area. And the other uh, question that you had pretty much answered, which has come from an up, a grade five student in Upper Grand District School Board was around, you know, what happens when people don't speak the same language and these agreements are being uh, made? Well, that's, that can be a challenge and that's where it's really important to be honest. And, um, and remember when, when I said that in, in all of those treaties, the, one of the ways that the indigenous peoples assumed uh, that they were dealing with honest people was when they had that sacred ceremony, often using a pipe and sharing tobacco, because even if they didn't understand that all of the language, even when a translator translated things, they could not, they would not believe that anybody would make a promise and, and um, untruthfully, particularly when it was done in a ceremony like that. 
like today, if you go into a court and you make a, if you make a statement after promising to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, and if that's found out to be untrue later, you go to jail. That That's a crime. <laughs> um, I get older students say, if, if Canada broke all these promises, these treaty promises, what, what are the consequences? Well, um, the consequences, if you're the largest group in a society, don't seem to be the same as if you're from a smaller group. And, um, but I can tell you, as far as Indigenous peoples are concerned, Canada breaks its own law every single day because it's not kept its treaty promises. Now, we hope, uh, we keep hearing words from our political leaders that they're going to keep the uh, promises, but, um, um, but progress is very slow. Also why this is important that we're learning about this so that the more people are aware about how these things are broken, then we can use our voices to speak up and speak out against that. So this next question comes from a, a grade six, seven class in the Hastings, Hastings Prince Edward District School Board. Um, and the question is, did the various different First Nations communities in Canada ever have an overall country-wide government body, or did they each have their own community-level systems of governance? Bit of a <laughs> <laughs> multi-pronged question, but maybe if you want to speak to um, the difference of governing structures and how maybe that's been well um, affected. Well, I, I, I'm I'm glad that there are people from Hastings Prince Edward here. I I lived in Belleville for many years. I was in the newspaper business, so I know that that area pretty well. So I'm glad that people are here. Um, our uh, Indigenous peoples always had our own systems of laws and governance, uh, and language and and belief systems. Um, you know, many people because they came here from other parts of the world and because our systems were different than theirs. They didn't think ours were as good, but, but people had lived here for thousands of years. Sure, they might have different nations, might have had differences of opinion from time to time, but, but, but they had lived here for thousands of years and didn't have nearly the, the, the types of wars that Europeans had almost every year. Um, uh, they could never get along. The French and English were having wars about every 10 years. Um, but Indigenous people seem to be able to get along side by side for, for thousands of years without these big wars. And they had different kinds of governance structures. Um, uh, the individual communities would have had their own structure to, to deal with, you know, day-to-day -day things like, like um, hunting and fishing and, and, and uh, sharing the wealth of communities. And for dealing with outside nations, they, they probably would have had, a, their collective nation would have had a, a body. And the best example is probably the, the, the six nations who at one time were five nations of Iroquois. And they had 50 chiefs. But they had, and each of those communities or, or groups had, their, as I said, their own local kind of governance. They, but they had a big law um, they call it the great law that governed how all, uh, all of their, their members should live. It was, and again, no law is perfect, but, but you have to have rules to have a good society. And they had, they had laws about, um, uh, you know, about, about how to, uh, even how to um, honor someone uh, who was given birth to a child or how to a funeral ceremony. They had all sorts of, of rules about how to deal with, with um, different things that come up in society. And that, that governance structure was saw to be so sophisticated that when the United States of America, when they broke away from England and wanted to set up their own government, they met with the leaders of the five nations to get information about how they govern themselves. And they modeled their, their system of government with a central government, which we now call a federal government, and then state governments, which in Canada we call provincial governments. And they actually, on the 200th anniversary of the United States Constitution, their big law, their, their 
um, members of Congress passed a, a resolution unanimously thanking the indigenous peoples of, of, the, of North America for helping show them uh, a system of government that they, uh, they still use today. So we had very sophisticated systems, different for different nations, but very sophisticated. Well, we've come to the end of our session today. And I just want to thank everyone for so many questions that have come in that we can't get to all of them. But thank you for um, submitting your questions and asking questions. Um, I want to remind people out there that for the different school boards that are participating, um, if you know, if you if you want to continue the conversation, um, to check in with your Indigenous education lead. Every school board has one um, to, uh, that can be, be a resource for you. Um, and so I'm just gonna turn it back over to you, Morris, for any last words as we close up our session today. Yes, um, uh, I wanna thank you, know, you, know, you Ms. Williams, for, for inviting me, of course, and, and, and giving me the opportunity to share what I know. I, I don't know everything for sure, nobody does, but I, whenever I share information about Indigenous issues like treaties, my intention is that, that it makes people who are listening interested in learning more. And there are many places now, uh, many resources out there, and, and there's an association called the First Nations Métis and Inuit Education Association of Ontario that it is a wonderful source of, of wonderful resources on all sorts of topics, environmental topics, treaties, um, and and I encourage all the teachers out there to you know to uh, pursue um, you know uh, finding out more about about that. Um, I, I do want to mention there's uh, many indigenous words tend to be very long, but you should know that the 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 Anishinaabemowin word for treaty is what. And that means promises that people make to each other. So promises. Um, uh, it's, that's, that's an important word. And I hope this week you, um, you remember a lot of things. This is a good week to remember things. And, and I, I, hope you, uh, uh, I hope you all stay healthy and happy. And I hope you all get A's on your report card. So miigwech. Thank you again.